Hello. Yeah, so there was this one time I went to US and at immigration, the, the guy at immigration, he was like, oh, since when your country changed the color of your passport? I'm like, what? <laughs> why, why are you asking such a question from me? And he's like, no, your country's passport supposed to be black, but now we ask, it's like maroon color, why is that? <laughs> I, I was like, oh my God, I have no idea what you're saying. So then he's like, you're from India, right? No, I said, no, I'm not from India. I'm from, coming from a country called Sri Lanka. Oh, then he was like, oh, that's another country. I didn't know there's such a country. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I have these experiences like throughout the world, wherever I go, I have to like, specifically say I'm, I'm a Sri Lankan and it's a tiny island below India. <laughs> so yeah, it's, I think it's a good thing for me. Like, so whenever if I feel like I'm like, okay, intimidated or something, I would just lean on saying, oh, I'm an Indian, I don't know. <laughs> I could move my head sideways and be like, okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry to offend you guys, I'm sorry. It's not to be like that, it's like we have this, uh, I guess it's a brotherly love of like uh, teasing each other, I guess, <laughs> when it comes to cricket mostly. Okay, so let's get back to the actual stuff, uh, the talk itself. So, yeah, as I said, I'm working for Nitrous. Uh, I want to give like a little introduction about Nitrous in case some of you might not know what Nitrous is. Like, we are on a mission of creating a less painful way of setting up your development environment. So if you are, like, for example, today, like if you're new to Go and you want, don't want to spend your time on installing everything on your local machine, or like if you feel like, oh, if I install Go, my pure Java uh, virginity might lose if I install Go on my local machine. So if you feel something like that, you can just head to the nitrous.io and sign up for an account, create a box with GoStack, and start coding on the browser itself. Uh, I think that's a pretty cool way to learn a new language, or if you want to play around with a new technology, do check out Nitrous. Uh, we want you to like, make the process a little easier when it comes to like, trying out new technologies. So the topic I'm going to talk today is building Internet of Things with Go. So I realized. So originally when I was sketching out this talk, I was planning to add more code samples, then more real-time demos and stuff like that. But then I realized, what if, if I'm going to sit on the audience and listen to myself speaking on this stuff? And I realized it talk happens to be in an afternoon. I would be, after, uh, I would be pretty much done with a good meal and I would want to like use off. And, <laughs> and that's not, on, only thing I won't want to do is like squint my eyes to the screen and try to figure out what this code does and things like that. So I took out most of the coding samples and uh, that's for a reason. So I would be focusing mostly on the uh, issues and like high level concerns that when it comes to the uh, IoT implementations and then how some technical like lead ways or like clues that you can grab today and try out like uh, when it comes to like if you want to play around this tips can help you, I guess. So the idea is that, like, to get you excited, to go home. Uh, if you take one thing from this conference, even if you don't use Go, like, you can still lean on, like, some of these technologies and maybe play around with your own favorite language, but then you will soon realize Go is a better choice for to do this kind of stuff, so then you can switch back. So that's the whole idea. And so this has been a recurring topic throughout this conference. Go as a language and go as a philosophy. So for me, like when it comes to like like, like systems like in Internet of Things, where the the fragile nature is pretty much existent on system itself. So these things can obviously fail. So the the way we actually try to imagine systems is like we always want to go through this happy path, where we expect everything to work perfectly and everything would be done smoothly. But that's not the reality. So one thing, like switching from other languages to Go that made me realize was this. So Go has this uh, nuance of like, you have to, when, whenever you run the function, you have to check for the errors. Like for some, this is like a, a pain in the ass, I would say, <laughs> like, so why would I have to like check for the errors every, every time I run the function? So that made me realize actually when you build these real life systems, this is something you cannot avoid. Like these systems are supposed to fail. So if you're not checking the errors, I mean, you're missing out a lot, right? So if that's just like you're a dump bound to be fail, like your systems are like just about to be crashed. So that's something I re realized that cannot be avoided. So it's better you address that early itself. 
So this philosophy of go that uh, when I, whenever I come to like picking up a technology, I guess I would apply the same principles. Like whenever like picking up a new technology, I would say how reliable it is, how it fault tolerant it can be. So this philosophy of go would be the underlying uh, underlying concept that would be throughout this talk. And though it's not though you won't be able to see like much go code, that philosophy would be on on on, on the Later layers, so you would see most of those things in that way. Okay, so but if you are like more into code, and if you really want to see Go code, and if you are really like feeling like I want to see how Go routines are used or how the channels are used in these cases, do head out to this repository. Or uh, this is the organization. Basically, we have a bunch of like this. This is like a hobby project of mine, and a few of my fellow friends like contributed to this. And this is a collection of repositories based around the ideas I'm going to talk today. And those ideas, you would see the implementation of those ideas from, uh, using Go on, on this repository. Yeah, some of the things might not might be rough on the edge. So be careful. Like Some, some things may not as work as, as it say, says on the readme. So in, if you bump into such cases, do reach me out, send an email, or I'll file an issue. Or better yet, you can send a pull request. OK. so. Bit of a history lesson. So this is the Apollo guide computer, guidance computer. This was released in 1966. That's like 50 years back. Back then, it had 100, one, one uh, megahertz of processing power and then four kilobytes of RAM. Yeah, four kilobytes of RAM, and it cost a whopping 150k. But the coolest part about this is, as you might know, what it helped us to achieve. This put a man on a moon, man on the moon. So today, I have this in my pocket. This is the new Raspberry Pi 2. It has 900 megahertz processing with four cores. Yeah, four cores, and it has one GB of RAM. And you know how much this costs? This is like 35 bucks. So it's crazy to imagine like how the technology has evolved over the period. And how cheap it is to like get to really fast com like computing at our disposal. And the, sadly, the problem here is like we put man on the moon with four kilobytes of RAM, and now we have this quad core processor. And what we are doing with that is this. <laughs> so yeah, this is like the famous Bill Murray tweet saying, yeah, like we have like two million time storage on our uh, iPhones, and this is what we are doing. So. Yeah, this actually rubbed me in the wrong way, and I was like, I was thinking, yeah, we can do better than this. I mean, the most of the apps we chase after or things we try to build are like just for the moment. But coming from a South Asian country, seeing how the systems are broken and how the technology can make a bridge of like at least like put something into the systems, like make them at least slightly better. So given the technology is cheap nowadays and it's pretty easy to throw a computer at a problem and fix that problem. It's pretty much possible to like change the world or our systems around us just by putting a little effort. So I guess this is the main inspiration for me personally to do a uh, checkout on Internet of Things, which I feel like uh, rather than just uh, connecting to a virtual world, we are connecting to our real lives. So the computing becomes part of our real lives. So it is a, a exciting prospect. So that's why I think this is like as I made a bet on Go three years back, like it's gonna be the next big thing. I'm betting on the Internet of Things at this point that this can actually change the way we look at our worlds, how we interact with our world. So, yeah. Then you might ask, what Go has to do with Internet of Things? Actually, Go is a great language to write programs for this all these modern devices. So, initially we used to think of Computer, like the Internet of Things or these embedded systems are to be like microcontrollers with little bit of RAM. So you need to dangle with C or C++ to write a, a firmware for these. And it's now no longer the case. Nowadays, as, as you saw already, like the Raspberry Pi 2 already comes with four cores. So which means like we already have enough computing power to do uh, better things. And Go is perfect in that sense. Like it's a language written uh, targeting these modern devices. So three things that mainly, um, in, uh, like mainly attracts me to Go is like the ability of creating static binaries. So that means 
um, if you look at most of the applications, like most of the IoT applications, those would be doing the one task, or like at least you would be doing like two tasks or something like that. So for these kind of cases, it's much better like if you can roll out a binary that just that uh, just do that one task. So without having to worry about shipping a runtime to execute your code or like shipping the libraries necessary to execute your code, you can bundle everything in a one binary and you have this a thin OS layer and on top of it you can run your Go code, which is a huge prospect when it comes to like writing applications for these devices. Also, yeah, I, as I keep mentioning, like we have these devices which has multiple cores nowadays, so it's no longer concurrence, it's no longer like an afterthought. It has to be part of the design process or the development process itself, so you cannot come back and say, okay, I'll think of concurrency afterwards. It's not like that. So when you have like four cores already, you should be taking use of those. So yeah, so that's another reason. And easy cross-compilation, I guess uh, huge props goes to Dave Cheney here. So for doing the, uh, coming up with these tools, like I know he's been busy building, checking out different architectures and trying to compile Go, uh, Go source for each of these architectures. So he has a great blog post on this topic on how to uh, cross-compile Go applications. So do check out the URL. I think uh, you can Google this or like you can easily find this or else you can wait till the slides are up online. But it's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, you do, sh do check out that uh, link to get uh, updated on how to cross-compile your application. So basically it's the same process of building any Go, uh, Go app, like you run Go build. But in this case, the only difference is like you set several environment variables, which says the target architecture. In this case, like I'm compiling for the Raspberry Pi, which is ARM architecture, and then I specify the version of ARM. So when you're uh, compiling for the ARM architecture, you have to specify the version of the ARM architecture. So if you are using the latest Raspberry Pi, it should be ARM version 7. And if you're building for something like Raspberry Pi B or B+, it would be ARM 5. And you have to specify the OS. It would be Linux in this case. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. And you have to do this on your like development machine. Like I've, I've seen people trying to do this, like they try to run, their, they write their code on the Raspberry Pi itself and try to compile on the Raspberry Pi and then come back saying, oh, Go is slow, the compilation is so slow. It's not like that. Like, I mean, you should not attempt to do that on your Raspberry Pi itself. It's better you try that on your development machine. You build it on your development machine and then send the code to your device. Okay, so now to actual implementations. So this is, I, I don't know, for some reason, like everyone thinks like, I don't know, even I fall into this trap again. So it's like when, when we are building like Internet of Things, it sounds like everyone has to build a smart lock. <laughs> so that seems to be like the easiest, get, like it's like the hello world of Internet of Things, building a smart lock. So <laughs> I also tried to build one. So when I was back home uh, during the vacation, I was, I had a house had this, garage where there was a door like and my parents usually forget to close this door and it uh, the, it creates some issues like some stuff mis mysteriously disappear so uh, I thought yeah maybe I'll come up with a smart solution where I check for the light and then I would automatically lock the door so I I was managed to like come up with a setup and then write a really small go application for this and it seemed to work and I installed this and went back <laughs> so Few days later, my mom calls me and tells, hey, the thing you installed on the door, now even when we have the door locked, it automatically unlocks the door. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> right, so then I had no clue what's going on. This was the biggest problem. Like, so if, if it was like a web application on the cloud, right, I can SSH to the server and check what's going wrong. I can check the logs uh, and see what's, where, where it went wrong and all, uh, if I can then post a fix or something. But in this case, like I have no physical access or like remote access to this device, like that's so far away from me. <laughs> so that made me really think about how we should be approaching this problem. It's like it's not the part of like writing the applications itself; it's the process of maintaining the application. So, which is a, another theme in Go, like in the Go philosophy, like creating maintainable applications. So, thinking of this, so I had to come up with like th I came up with these three questions. So, th based on this issue I had, I uh, came up with these three questions that probably needs to be answered. 
So how do we deploy code to these devices? That's like the first question. And then how do we communicate with these devices? And also, how do we keep these things secure? So I don't know whether it's my neighbor like mysteriously figured out the protocol and sending unlock signal every time. I hope it's not the case, but I better want it to be secure. <laughs> okay, so how do we deploy code? So as we already know, the cloud de uh, deployment process, like when we build cloud applications, we have a defined deployment process. We do it often and we do it like incrementally. We build features, we roll out the feature, we test it out and we keep on building. So which is the process we are kind of familiar. We have, the, uh, we have our deployment tools built for it, like stuff like Capistrano or even the chef provisioning, like works in this way. And that's like the most uh, closest way of like, if you're coming from cloud applications, like building cloud applications, that's the process we are mostly familiar with. And then we have this other paradigm of mobile platforms where we focus mainly on the stability of the system. So we don't want to uh, release some code and just break the device. So that's the biggest concern. So we don't want that to happen. So most of the time on mobile devices, that's why we go through like a review process and then the application gets published. So when it comes to IoT, we have to find a balance between these two paradigms. Like we still need that flexibility of deploying cloud applications. Plus also we don't want to just accidentally break our devices. So I was playing around with this idea for a while and I was trying to figure out a better way, then apparently Canonical also had the same idea. So they came up with something called Snappy Ubuntu. So Snappy Ubuntu is a lean version of Ubuntu OS itself, uh, but it has some really nice features that's targeted for the I IoT kind of deployments. So it has transactional updates, which means it's pretty similar to how you deploy on, on the cloud, where you have multiple versions deployed and then there would be a current version, which would always symbolize to the latest version you, have, uh, uh, you deploy. And if that version works, it's fine. You can keep it as the current. And in case of a failure, you can roll back to the previous version. So this is pretty much like the way you deploy on the cloud. You can have these kind of transactional updates. Then it also provides something called application isolation, which, which is like sandboxing mechanism. Um, it's like containerizing your applications in, a, in, its, uh, in its own environment. So this also provides that. And also, it has this thing of uh, operating system level stability, which means, let me explain that on the next slide. So Ubuntu Core is built in such a way that it has three main partitions. So one is called system A, and there's a system B. These are like identical partitions of the same root image. Like it's the same root image, like it's, but it's on two partitions. So you start off with that, and then there would be something called writable partition, which is where your application data and configuration goes. So when the, uh, when the boot up process happens, it picks either system A or B on the first instance, and then it would overlay the writable partition on top of it. So your application would work like that, or your OS would continue to run, and say if there's a security update or something. So then you can update the, say if you're running with system A, now you can update system B. So that would uh, be the process of like updating the OS, so OS would always pick the other partition which is not running and update that partition. So once that partition is updated on the next reboot, it would boot up with the new, newly updated partition and it would again overlay the writable on top of that partition. Okay, so what if something breaks, like say if the update breaks or application or something like that happens, which allows you to go back to the previously working version, say if you switch to system B, and system B fail for some reason, you can always switch back to system A because you know it was on a working state before. So this uh, flexibility is kind of nice, which provides uh, OS level stability for your applications. Okay, so you can build your Go applications for Ubuntu Snappy like this. It's uh, the process of building the app itself is the same as I mentioned earlier, but then you would need to like to package the Snappy app. You would need some, uh, a meta directory which would contain a package YML and a readme. So the package YML, the interesting bit about this is like you can define services. So for example, in your Go app, if you want to run this app, like whenever the OS is booted up, you want to run an app. So you specify the start script. So that would, it would give the path to your binary uh, and it would run automatically when the OS is booted up. And you can specify the port. Uh, if, if you are listening on a certain port, your application 
bit listens on a certain port, you can specify that port is required. Say, for instance, if you have like two applications trying to listen on the same port, uh, there could be a conflict. So the OS provide, like prevents that from happening. So once you specify the package YML, you can build using the snappy build command. This would get your binary and then uh, the meta directory and create a snappy package, which you can push to uh, the device using, currently there's a command called snappy remote, but I guess it's not going to be useful because you would want to have your own deployment mechanism because these devices won't be accessible through SSH or similar mechanism. So currently I'm trying with snappy remote, but eventually I think we would have to move to something different. And the next question is, how do we communicate with the devices? Okay, so the biggest issue is like, these devices run with unreliable power and unstable network sources. So the, it, the chances of things breaking is pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Like it's pretty common to like, you lose the network connection and things would not work after that. So, and also as I mentioned, like there's no dedicated IP address, like most of this stuff would run uh, behind your home router. So you won't be able to like directly SSH to the device. And also uh, in case like if you have a deployment on a remote location or somewhere like then you would be using not Wi-Fi but a mobile data, uh, some sort of a mobile data package. So those would be like charged by the bytes and it would be quite expensive. If you try to use something like HTTP protocol, it would be kind of an overhead and uh, you would be always sending like four kilobytes or something like four kilobytes of a header, which is like a waste of bytes in this case where you want to save every, like save on every byte. So the good, uh, the protocol that's uh, possible, that makes it possible to do IO is like the one that's been around in the community is the MQTT protocol, which is a pretty lightweight connectivity protocol that still runs on top of TCP and it uses a broker-based messaging system and also it is quite well tested in the cases of like uh, spacecraft missions and even when it comes to most common use cases, the Facebook Messenger as most of you would know, like most of you wouldn't be using Facebook Messenger, but you might not know it runs on top of MQTT. So the life cycle of an MQTT client is basically you connect to this broker and you would subscribe to certain topics. You would say, I would want to listen on these topics. And also the client can publish on certain topics. And finally, the, in an ideal world, it would disconnect. But in most cases, what would happen is like, it would just die. Like as the cases I mentioned earlier, there would be like an unreliable network connection or there could be a power outage or something like that could happen and it could just die. So the, uh, so the promising factor of this protocol is it, uh, it provides a way, to, like it knows that this thing can fail and it provides a mechanism to like, recover or right, at least get you a notification when things fails. So this is done with the will, something called will. It's pretty similar to in real life how we uh, write a will, say, when I die, like do these things. So we would keep this with a lawyer, right? So something similar you can do with the uh, impurity protocol. When you connect your client to the broker, you can say, this is my will. In case I die, like do this, like basically like it would publish a message on certain topic. So anyone who subscribed to that topic would be able to make use of that message and do whatever the necessary things. Like for example, you can have a SMS notification that would be sent out to you when the device dies. So there could be like several scenarios uh, how the device can die and I'm not going to go through each of those since I'm like running out of time. And basically the message structure looks like this. There's a header and a payload. So as I said, the protocol itself is pretty lightweight. So the header is like a fixed header. It would be like two bytes. And depending on the type of the message you send, there would be like a variable header. Uh, it can contain multiple things. For example, the case, uh, the connect case where you can have a build message and something similar like that. And the payload is basically a byte slice. And this byte slice can, you can put a, like a serialized JSON or protobuf, or even if you want to put like a primary data type, it would be also fine. So you can send anything through this byte slice. And the other interesting thing about MQTT is the quality of service. It uh, allows the, allows us to have a guarantee of message delivery. So on most cases, the default is like uh, to have the quality of service to zero, which means 
you don't care about the message delivery. You try to send the message, and if it fails, you don't care. But it would be better, like in case of, if you want to have the message to be delivered at least once. So you can set the quality of service to one. Like when you connect your client to the broker, you can say, "I want the quality of service to be one." And there's another level which is quality of service two, which means like you deliver the message only once. You make sure the message goes only once. But given that it's like pretty hard in the cases, like you have to make sure your network is like stable enough. Like oh, yeah, there could be like package, uh, the packets can be delayed, and for some reason it can still arrive late. And then you have to have like extra mechanism to make sure that you only receive it one time. So uh, then like quickly go through this like. Uh, the way you like guarantee the message delivery, you have to persist the message. So when the client or the server connects next time, you try to resend these packages or the missing messages. So for that, you might need to like store the messages. For that, uh, uh, you would need a storing mechanism. So depending on the library you're using to implement MQTT, uh, you might have to figure out how do you implement the storage. So the library I was using is it's kind of weird the name like the naming is not really the idiomatic go away, but it provides provide a good uh, combination of solutions to like implement uh, a QoS. So it provides a uh, interface where it specifies a bunch of methods that you can use to implement your own message persistent mechanism. So it provides memory and file storage mechanisms on its own. And if you want, you can try something like level DB, which can be interesting to implement. OK, so last thing is how to keep things secure. So there's like two ways of, two types of security we have to be concerned. One is like the runtime security. So that for runtime security, if you package your apps and send them over snappy packages, uh, it, pro it runs the apps with a Farmer profile, which means it would al already have some um, some combination of security mechanisms like the file, uh, the file uh, access uh, security, and also like the network security layers. So it would provide a basic level of security in that case. But if you want a fine grained level of security, you can write your own app Palmer profile and specify that on the package YML. And for the connectivity layer security, uh, MQTT supports sending the messages over TLS socket. So this is, this can be slightly expensive because say if your connection is unreliable, if it keeps failing, you might have to do the TLS handshake every time you establish the connection. So this can mean like you're spending few few more bytes on each connection and it's not the fastest way to do it. So, but if the security is a concern, you might want to consider using TLS software to like send your messages. Okay, so since that time is up, I don't know whether I can take questions.